Revelation 14. I'll begin reading in verse 14 to the end of the chapter. John writes, Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and sitting on the cloud was one like a son of man, having a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hands. And another angel came out of the temple, crying out with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, because the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, and he also had a sharp sickle. Then another angel, the one who had the power over fire, came out from the altar and he called with a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle saying, put in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth because her grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle to the earth and gathered the clusters from the vine of the earth and threw them into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city and blood came out from the winepress up to the horse's bridles for a distance of 200 miles. It's often been said that there are two kinds of Christians in the world. Those that are deeply troubled by what the Bible says about hell and those that just don't think about it. (laughs) I've mentioned before that belief in hell is probably the most universally held doctrine. More people believe in hell than, than even believe in God, it seems. Just about every religion in the world, every major religion has some concept of hell. Even in your good old fashioned, typical agnostic American would say there's got to be a place called hell. But it's a strange corollary to that, that while belief in hell seems to be universal, there's almost nobody who thinks they will end up there. Everybody believes in hell, just nobody thinks they're going there. That's a testimony, I think, to our own self-righteousness, our inherent idea that, you know, we try good, our lack of belief in depravity, we don't understand that depravity taints all that we do, and so we think, you know what, I I do good and I try hard, and so God will understand. It's a low view of God, it's a view that diminishes God's holiness. When somebody doubts the eternal nature of hell, they're basically saying that there's no being in the world that is perfect enough, that is good enough, that is exalted enough to demand an infinite punishment for transgressing him. Since I don't believe in that kind of exalted being, then I don't need to believe in eternal punishment. It is, as the psalmist says, that some people doubt hell because they think that God is just like they are. Some people think that God is just like them, but I'll tell you this, God is not like you. God is exalted, he is different, he is set apart, he is holy, he has eyes that are too pure to behold evil. We are not like him. If somebody were to cross you and you were to say, you deserve an eternal punishment for crossing me, you would come across as a monster. Who exactly do you think you are? But for God to be crossed and not demand an eternal punishment, it would make a a mockery of the whole concept of justice, a whole mockery of everything that is divine, a mockery of God himself. This passage here in Revelation 14 should awaken our senses to that reality. If you're a believer in Christ, this passage should should fan the flame of of evangelism in your heart. It should make you rejoice that you've been spared from hell as your destiny. If you're not a Christian, if you've never given your life to Christ, this passage should fill you with fear. It should open your eyes. It should chill your spine. It should make you tremble at what awaits all those who die. After all, it was indeed our Lord who said, narrow is the road that leads to eternal life. And there are very few who find it. Broad is the way to destruction. Seems like everybody is on it. Most people fancy themselves immune to that reality. They fancy themselves immune to hell as their destiny. They don't think it will affect them. The doctrine of hell is in the scripture to to cause us sorrow. We sorrow over the lost. We sorrow over those we know who have died and gone there. More than that, we should sorrow over those who are alive here and now in this world and who are on their way there, most of whom it seems are going there unawares. Nobody has cared for them enough to warn them. Nobody has, has loved them enough to sound the alarm or perhaps the alarm has been sounded and yet their ears have been covered. 
As we go through this passage this morning, let me give you three fear-inducing truths about hell. Three fear-inducing truths about hell. When you look at these three fears, it should, it should fill your heart with trepidation. It should give your mind clarity as you think about the eternal nature of the human soul. And it should bring to bear the truth of Scripture on your view of the afterlife. Three fear-inducing truths about hell. First, the immediacy of judgment the immediacy of judgment, that hell comes for those who die apart from Christ immediately. There is no pause. There is no resting in peace. They close their eyes in this world. They open their eyes in torment in the next. There's no intermediate time. There's no holding tank. There's there's no purgatory. There's no resting place. There's no soul sleep. There is no resting in peace. They may die peacefully in this world. They are not peaceful in the next. The most common word in this passage that we just read, you heard it seven times, is the word sickle, sickle, sickle. Not a common English word. We don't even farm with sickles in our country. We have massive combines. And so you'd be forgiven if you didn't even know what a sickle is. And yet it's seven times in this concise passage. A sickle is a, a, it's on a stick with a serrated edge at the top. It's a hook that comes around the end at the top. And the way you would farm in the, the Roman Empire, the ancient Near East, in fact, much of Asia today still farms this way with a sickle. The, the wheat would grow or whatever crop it is would grow. And the farmer would come with his left hand and grab the, the grass or grab the wheat, grab the, the sheaves and grab it and you twist with your wrist. So you grab it and you twist with your wrist like this and then you get the sickle and you pull towards you. So you twist and pull towards you. It's a very labor intensive way of farming. The farmer of the crop is small, is hunched over as he leans down to, to, to harvest it. But the difference between a sickle and a combine, you think it's going to escape the combine. A sheave can be bent over with a combine and it goes over and it doesn't get harvested. It gets trampled for sure, but it doesn't get severed. Not so with a sickle. There is no escaping a sickle. If the farmer grabs it, it's coming out of the ground. The sickle doesn't miss. Everything that's in the clutch of the farmer will be cut out, will be severed. That's the nature of a sickle. And that's why John uses this analogy seven times in this passage for us on our way into hell. For the judgment of the earth as uh, as the people on earth are ushered into hell, it's a sickle. That's the metaphor. That God will grab the earth, he will twist the earth, and there is no escaping from the clutches of his grasp. It's a razor sharp tool. It would cut and pull towards the farmer and it was simply devastating with no escape. If something is in the farmer's hand, it is is as good as reaped. That's the nature of the sickle. And I say it happens immediately because that's the imagery here. You don't know when it will happen to you. Now clearly in Revelation 14, it's describing a specific event at the end of the tribulation. A massive battle, the Battle of Armageddon, it's towards the end of the chapter described. We've seen this in Zechariah 14, Ezekiel 38 and 39. Describe this, it's a massive battle where the bloodshed will be immense. The angels here are reaping on the earth. But as Revelation plays out, we recognize it's not just describing those who were killed in the Battle of Armageddon. The whole earth will be ushered in. The whole earth will be reaped. In fact, even the language it is in here, the hour to reap has come because the harvest, verse 15, on the earth is ripe. This is speaking of a global judgment. It's not just in Israel. It's not just in the Armageddon Valley. This is a global judgment. The earth itself is ripe for the harvest. The metaphor might be a farmer looking at all of his crop being white and ready for harvest and seeing a particular field here and describing the judgment in this little corner of the field, yet it's by extension, it's true of the whole field itself. Revelation 14 describes the battle at the end of the tribulation, but by extension, this is how everybody who dies apart from Christ will be ushered into judgment. The sickle is sharp and there is no escape. It happens immediately when it falls upon them. It is appointed for man once to die and then the judgment. Even in the parable of the seed in Mark chapter 4, verses 26 to 29, Jesus describes the, the, the farmer who throws a seed, goes home and sleeps. He wakes up when the field is ripe and he goes out and Jesus uses the word immediately. He, when the crop permits, he says, he immediately takes a sickle to it and severs it. The concept of the sickle applies immediacy. It's sharp and it does its job instantly. In this passage, you see the hour has come. The season is here. The appointed time for judgment has arrived. 
There is no escaping this. There's no deferring this. There's no rescheduling this. Or as Paul says elsewhere, it is appointed for man once to die and then the judgment. God has appointed the moment of death. You'll close your eyes in this world and wake up in the next and you can't outrun it. Only God knows when it will happen. We moved into our house and our neighbor had, this is five years ago, our neighbor had a, a cat that was an outdoor cat and skinny and mangly and disgusting looking really. And we asked about the cat and they said, oh, this cat is so old. This cat is so old. It's, you know, probably 15 years old or whatever. It says, no, you don't even need to worry about it. It's going to die any moment. Well, our neighbors have recently moved out of their house now and that cat at this very moment is asleep on my couch. <laughs> <laughs> this has become my cat. <laughs> we're, we're now cat people. We have a cat. This is a cat that has escaped death more times than I can count. I heard shrieking a few years ago on my back porch. I went outside and the cat was in this fight to the death with a possum and the cat escaped. <laughs> Blast from the hose, they scattered. <laughs> cat owes me his life now. <laughs> you see hawks circling above this thing, eyeing it. There's no legitimate reason this thing should still be alive. <laughs> it has exhausted all nine of its lives. <laughs> And yet it still pushes forward. You know, such it is with us, we think. We can po postpone death. We think that it won't hit us. But listen, God has fixed a time for judgment. He knows when you will die and you will not outrun it. You won't escape it. You know, go to the gym all you want. Juice it up for all I care. <laughs> You're not going to push back the appointed time for judgment. And for some people, death has not come as a surprise. You know, it takes a long time. There's the cancer diagnosis, there's the treatment, there's the, you know, the relapse, there's back to the hospital, there's home for hospice, there's not, not eating, there's wasting away and, if, you know, in and out of consciousness and finally death. It seems like years go by before it happens. For other people, death is immediate, an accident or something like that. You see a phrase in the newspaper that something happened to somebody and they died immediately, the journalist always says, immediately it happened to them. And you wonder why, how would they know, firstly, but secondly, why would that be, why, why would readers wonder that? And readers wonder that. You read a story about a, a car accident or something or a bus accident or some freak accident. You wonder, did the person see it coming? And maybe you, you think that way because you have sympathy for the person. I mean, did they suffer? That's what you're going through your mind. May I know some people that think that way because they, they think that before they die, they'll at least have a few moments to get their thoughts together, a few moments for a final prayer, a few moments to try to make things right with God. And so you see a story like that and you're wondering, did they know? Did they have those few moments? But listen, regardless of whether it takes years or it's immediate, when the eyes are closed on the other side, it is quicker than that. There is no, there might be a buildup to physical death. There is not a buildup to eternal punishment. As soon as the person dies in this world, their eyes are opened, their disembodied spirit is alive, a well, a well, awake, and fully conscious of the torment that awaits it. You close your eyes in this world, you open them in the next to be fully aware of your punishment that you deserve, to be fully aware of your sins. Your conscience itself will condemn you. Your conscience defends you in this life. It will not defend you in the next life. It will go from defending you here and now to condemning you in eternity. That is what awaits and it happens immediately. For those of us who are in Christ, to live is Christ, to die is gain. You live for Christ and so death is marked by gaining what you live for. To live is Christ, to die is gain. For those of you who are apart from Christ, you live for something else. Death is not gain because you lose whatever you were living for. You live for yourself, you live for pride and your own sense of self-worth, you lose that in the next life. You live for your family, you lose that in the next life. You live for money, you lose that in the next life. You live for your false religion, you lose that in your next life. If you say to live is anything other than Christ, then death most certainly will not be gained for you. For the believer, absent from the body is present with the Lord. For those who've never given their life to Christ, absent from the body means present in hell, present in the eternal torments of God. And it happens immediately. You will not be called to stand before God and make a defense for yourself. You'd be unable to anyway. What would you say? 
People think that uh, God will know my heart. God will know that I try to be a good person. Listen, your problem is that God does know your heart. He's not gonna buy whatever lies you have. I mean, there's so much sophisticated sophistry that people use in their mind. Oh, I won't go to hell because, you know, look how bad the world is. And God will know that I don't like the direction the world is going, and so I'm going to be okay. Hardly. Hardly. You won't have a time to make a defense for yourself. Your cheap and pathetic excuses won't even get out of your mouth when you stand before God. You will be reaped immediately. As John says early in Revelation, I saw death and with him coming hell. Death comes and hell was following closely after and you don't know when it will happen. People think that they are in charge of how long they live their life. Do you know that there are so many ways for God to take you out of this world? There's so many ways. Even right now, you think you're healthy? Your house is locked. You don't have cancer. You have health insurance. You went for a run this morning. What could go wrong? Listen, there are so many ways for God to take you out of this world. To, it, and here's the thing about it. If God were to use any of those ways to take you out of the, the world, those who know you would be surprised. Oh, I, we weren't expecting him to die so soon. We thought he would have many more years left. He went before his time. That would be those who know you. But listen, those who don't know you and just to hear about what happened, who have no personal involvement with you, and they hear about how God took you out of this earth, there's so many normal ways for God of doing that, they wouldn't even bat their eye. They would hear about how God took you out of this world, and it wouldn't even strike them as miraculous. God wouldn't even have to suspend the normal way the world works. It wouldn't take a miracle to kill you in a totally normal way that is entirely unexpected to you at this moment. That's the reality. You think you'll live forever? God has no shortage of ways of taking people at their appointed time that wouldn't even make the news. Jonathan Edwards said it this way, the arrows of death fly around you at noonday and you think you're safe because you can't see them. They're flying over your shoulder, across your feet, around your head, and you're unaware of them, and so you think you will live forever. But listen, my friends, one of them will strike you, and God will take you out of this world at his appointed time, and if you die apart from Christ, you will immediately open your eyes in judgment. You'll say like the rich man in Jesus' parable, why did I not listen? Why did I not heed the warning? Why didn't I do what people warned me to do and flee to Christ? Why did I neglect the gospel when I had time? Oh, I knew of it. I heard of it. Why didn't I respond when I heard the warning? But it will be too late. Death and judgment come with immediacy. Secondly, they come with intensity, the intensity of judgment, the immediacy of judgment and the intensity of judgment. I told you seven times in this passage is the word reaped. Four of those times it's described as a, I mean, is the word sickle. Four of those times it's described as a sharp sickle. John is making the point that this comes with violence. It comes with a severity and a violent act upon it. It's a severe judgment. The great white throne is where this judgment takes place. It will be set up with the pomp of the reaping angels around it. The six angels in Revelation 14, three warning against judgment and three ushering the judgment in. They will be there at the great white throne, ushering souls to damnation. Every eye there will behold the lake of fire, the eternal destination of all those who die apart from Christ. Their whole, the whole world will see it, Isaiah 66 says. Those who are condemned at the great white throne will be an abhorrence to all flesh. It will be shocking, even in eternity, we make so many excuses why we won't end up there. But Christ describes clearly what awaits those who die apart from him. It's a sharp sickle. The angel that comes has the power of fire, it says in verse 18. The angel comes with the power over fire. That's an allusion to chapter 8. Chapter 8, there was the fire in the temple, the eternal temple. The fire was the prayers of the saints. That angel took some of the fire, if you remember, and flung it to earth. And when the angel flung the fire to earth, that became the seven trumpet judgments. The earth was rocked. The sky went dark. The water was poisoned. Third of the earth died immediately. 
There's global warfare, global famine. The fish all die. The boats are all capsized. People are hiding behind mountains. That is what happens when the angel flings fire onto the earth. Like that. It is the most graphic devastation, the great tribulation, the most graphic devastation in the earth's history apart from Noah's flood. And the angel just flings fire. What you're seeing here in chapter 14 is not the angel flinging fire. It's the angel with the power, the authority over that fire. And he's coming to usher people into hell. If he can destroy the earth by flinging fire on it, imagine what he can do if he spends eternity crafting it. This will not just be a flippant tribulation that comes upon the earth and just merely kills a third of the population. This will be something much, much worse. It's compared to the wine press here. In verse 18, in verse 18, this angel with the power of a fire calls with a loud voice to the angel with the sharp sickle saying, put in your sharp sickle. Gather the clusters from the vine of the earth because your grapes are ripe. Now here the analogy is changing from how they would reap the wheat. It's changing now to a, a, a grape analogy, a wine analogy. The, the grapes are big, so harvest them. The grapes are now harvested. And the imagery here is the farmer looks at the grapes and they're not the right kind of grapes. They're rotten. They're spoiled. They're, they're not sweet. They won't be good for anything except destruction. It had nothing to do with the ground, ground it was planted in. The ground was made perfectly for them to be fruitful vines. But they were not fruitful. They were poisonous, ruinous, sinful vines. And so now they're harvested. What is the farmer going to do with them? What does the angel do with all these rotten grapes? Well, he flings them, it says, into the great winepress of the wrath of God, verse 19 says. He throws them into a winepress reserved for wrath. Now these rotten grapes are flung in the wine press. What happens in the wine press is they're trampled on. The grapes would be squashed. They would be devastated. You know, this is an image of God's power. He could part the Red Sea with his finger. He could have the walls of Jericho fall with a wave of his hand. He could create the universe with words from his mouth. Imagine the suffering he can inflict when he tramples on souls forever. Imagine what blows he can strike. Imagine what force is in his legs. Imagine what kinetic energy he possesses for the purpose of harming. This is why it's called a sharp sickle. This is Joel's analogy, Joel chapter 3. Joel prophesies this event saying, put in the sickle for the harvest is ripe. Come tread upon the wine press until it's full, until the vats overflow because their wickedness is great. Joel prophesies this event and says Yahweh will sickle them and then trample them until it's overflowing from the wine press of his wrath. Lamentations chapter 1, Jeremiah comes upon Jerusalem totally destroyed. He had warned them for years and years, decades, to flee the wrath of God. And they ignored him. They threw Jeremiah out of Jerusalem. He comes back only to find it a smoldering pile of ruins. He begins lamentation saying this, the Lord has rejected all of my strong men, he says. The Lord rejected all of my soldiers. He called an appointed time against me to crush my young men. The Lord has trodden as in a wine press the virgin daughter of Judah. The Lord will trample those people. Jeremiah warned them and warned them, and now he says they're just being trampled by God in his wine press of wrath. Revelation 14, this very chapter is where it's described as eternal. The trampling goes on and on forever. Revelation 14, verse 11, the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They will never stop being trampled. Even a grape could be eventually squashed into oblivion, but not a human soul. The smoke will go up forever and ever. They will have no rest, verse 11 says, day or night, those who worship the beast in his image. And of course, remember earlier in Revelation 14, that's the whole earth. That's all those who are apart from Christ have the spirit of Antichrist that dwells in them. Their smoke will go up forever. Jesus in Mark 8 verse 12 says hell is a place where souls are cast, thrown into outer darkness where there's wailing and gnashing of teeth. Notice that verb cast. It's the same verb we see here in Revelation 14 that the grapes will be flung there. Matthew 13, 42, Jesus says hell is like a furnace where the souls are cast and there is wailing and weeping and gnashing of teeth. Revelation 24, I mean, sorry, Matthew 24, verse 51, describes hell as a furnace where there is suffering, burning, and wailing and gnashing of teeth. 
This is the devastation that God will bring and it will last forever and ever. Now here in the battle in the tribulation, it's describing an actual battle that will happen at the end of the tribulation. The battle will take place in the Valley of Armageddon. We've read about this before. It's Ezekiel 38 and 39 describe this battle. This is the battle in Ezekiel. It says it will take them weeks to clean up from. Now we know why. It's described again in Revelation 19 as the battle that ushers in the, the kingdom of our Lord on the earth. It'll take place in the Valley of Armageddon. Israel is 200 miles from uh, you know, I guess northeast to southwest, 200 miles across that nation. Valley of Armageddon is on the north side. From the Valley of Armageddon, it drains into the Sea of Galilee and the Jordan River goes down to the Dead Sea. There's also all these, these creeks and, and uh, arroyos that go from the Valley of Armageddon down. Some of them funnel into Jerusalem where they get to go south into the, the Judean wilderness. There will be such devastation there. The blood will flow out of that valley. It will fill up those creeks. It'll fill up those arroyos. The, the blood will be four feet deep, it says, up to a horse's chest for 200 miles. It doesn't mean all of Israel for 200 miles will be covered in four feet of blood. It's describing the blood that is flowing through those channels that come into Jerusalem. This is a devastating scene. That's a bloodbath in Israel. But the extension here, this bloodbath that's described is not just for those at the end of the tribulation. It is for all those who die apart from Christ. If that's how it's described on earth, imagine what the torment in eternity is like. That's the analogy. Verse 18 says it's for those who receive the wrath of God. Verse 19 says God is going to throw them in the wine press of the wrath of God. This is eternal. This is those who die apart from Christ where they will be trampled down forever. Because it's eternal, that speaks to thirdly, the eternality of the judge. You see the immediacy of the judgment, the intensity of the judgment, and thirdly, the eternality of the judge. What a contrast this judgment is with the glory of the one who's bringing it. In verse 14, then I looked. Behold, one like a son of man. Now it's, you wonder, is this Jesus? And it is Jesus. It's the same language used to describe him in Revelation 1, where he's described as one like a son of man. It's obviously Jesus in Revelation 1. Why does it say like a son of man instead of the son of man? And the reason is the way the Greek language works with, with articles. There's, if you say the son of man, you're saying by identity he's a son of man. If you say a son of man, you're saying he has the quality of a son of man. So this is how it's being described here. Jesus here is coming with all the qualities of the Son of Man. Son of Man is a title from Daniel 7 where the Son of Man is the one who comes to judge the earth. He comes in the cloud with judgment. He comes with his angels with him bringing judgment onto the earth. He's described as the Son of Man because he's divine. He has access to the eternal judgments of God. There's no mystery. Son of Man becomes a claim of deity. It's the phrase Jesus most commonly uses to describe himself. 81 times, I think, in the Gospels, Jesus calls himself the Son of Man. And it's often connected to the bringing of judgment. You will open your eyes and you'll see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with his angels in great glory, Jesus says. That's this scene here, Revelation 14, 14. There's the white cloud sitting on the cloud was one like the Son of Man. This is the cloud described in the Gospels with Jesus coming in it. He has a golden crown on his head demonstrating his, he is the ancient of days. That's the language from Daniel 7. The son of man is the ancient of days. Jesus comes like the son of man because he is the ancient of days. He's the creator of the universe. He's the judge of the universe. He bookends all of human existence. He starts it by speaking it into existence. He brings it to a close by ushering people into hell. He is the only one with this crown. He has the crown in his hand, head and a sickle in his hand. They are not opposites. They're connected in John's mind. He can yield the sickle because he wears the crown. He can send people into an eternal judgment. And again, we understand this even in our American culture. We understand that the punishment oftentimes corresponds to the, the identity, the quality of the person who is offended. You know, if you threatened to, to kill me, you might have some kind of simple assault kind of prosecution, a misdemeanor probably. If you threaten to kill a federal agent, well, suddenly things just got a little bit more serious. If you threaten to kill the president, things got ratcheted up a whole bunch, didn't they? And we understand that. That's how it should be. Your consequence for the, for the crime is 
commensurate to the integrity of the office of the person whom you're, you're threatening. You know, our country has treason, uh, death penalty for treason. If you commit espionage against your work, they can't execute you. If you commit espionage against your country, you could be executed. What do you think about raising your fist against God? The eternal creator, the one with the golden crown on his head. What kind of punishment do you think goes with that? It won't be brief. You won't be let off with a warning. And again, if God could ever overlook that kind of offense, then God would not have the holy perfections of deity. I read a Christian science book once that was trying to talk people out of believing in hell. And it used the example of if you're walking down the street and you see a dog suffering, a dog got hit by the car and it's suffering on the side of the road and you had a gun, what a good person should do is kill the dog. And then we understand that, of course. How much more should God, if he's really good, put wretched human souls out of their suffering existence? Why would hell be eternal? If a human knows to shoot the dog, wouldn't God know to, to stop us from suffering in eternity? But that misunderstands, that analogy is totally contorted because it misunderstands the creature creation dynamic, the creature creator dynamic. God as the creator is infinitely holy with infinite perfections and is infinitely exalted and any sin against him demands an infinite punishment. It's not a dog against an owner. It's not a dog suffering. It's human souls made by God for his glory and his good pleasure that rebel against him and besmirch his character. I mean, you have to get through your mind that God is glorified through hell. Hell exists because it glorifies God. Everything that exists glorifies God in some way. Hell glorifies God by showing his infinite worth, at the very least, by showing the infinite worth of the grace shown to those who put their faith in Christ. How much more magnified is grace to the existence of hell? Infinitely is the answer. Grace is infinitely more valuable because hell is eternal. The other side of that is God is infinitely exalted, which demands an infinite hell. He is the ancient of days. He has the crown on his head and the sickle in his hand. What the angels do from the fire, you can tell they've been waiting to do. These six angels have been held back, held back, but now the time is here and they are released and they will usher people immediately into the severe punishment of hell and it will last forever and ever because the judge is eternal. You know, praise the Lord that heaven lasts forever and ever that we will rejoice in God. You will never be bored in heaven. You're never gonna wake up one day in heaven and be like, oh, this is the same as history. This is lame. It's not going to happen. You will grow in your knowledge of God forever because again, he is eternal. You will always grow in your knowledge of him. You will always grow in your love for him. You will always grow into your delight for him. You will always grow in your love and adoration for God forever and ever and ever. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's grace than when we first begun. 10,000 years in heaven and you won't, you won't have even made a dent in eternity and you'll be excited about that. Now imagine the corollary of that for those in hell, that they will never make a dent in their sentence. They were, in the same way in heaven, you're always growing in your knowledge of God. In hell, the person is always growing in their understanding of how much they deserve this judgment, which always makes it worse. The more they know, the, they realize they deserve it, the worse it becomes and it increases that way forever. They'll sing the opposite song. When, when we've been there 10,000 years suffering the pain of hell, we've no less time to fear God's pain than when we first begun. That's the song from hell. 10,000 years, they won't be able to open their eyes and think that a single dent is made, made in their sentence. Not a single line has been drawn on the wall. They're no closer to release than when they first arrived. Note too, the contrast here. The king, the judge comes robed in white on a white cloud with a golden crown. Think of his purity and his majesty. Now go to the bloodbath at the end of this chapter. The sinner covered in blood, blood pouring through the streets. The white holiness and majesty of Christ, the stained soul red with blood, red with guilt, red with the fires of hell. That is the contrast here. That's what we deserve. We deserve to be swept away in the torrent of judgment. God is not like us. 
We find ourselves in the bloodbath. God finds himself holding the sickle. When I was in India last, there's this massive dam, one of the biggest dams in the, the nation, the northern side of the country that harvests the water that comes out of the, the Nepalese mountains there, the Himalayas. The dam had been rising, and so they, they opened it. And the river that comes out of this dam goes across the whole nation of India. It's, it's an incredibly long river, one of the longest rivers in Asia, stretches from the dam all the way, winds all the way down across the whole nation. Well, this dam, the water had been running at the same level for, I don't know, a decade or something. People would build parks and stuff along the, the river all the way through it. But when the water began to rise, they, they increased the water flow. They opened up all the, the, uh, the valves and the water rose suddenly on the other side of the dam. Suddenly it, it rose in a massive amount and it flooded a huge area. Now on the plans, of course, it was all floodplain. The government didn't need legal permission to do that. They didn't understand that all these provinces had built parks along the river all the way down the river. It was front page news when I was there. All kinds of stories about how many people drowned in the flooding. There was video, all these kind of people in, that could catch a video of these people in the parks. They're up on hills videoing people in the parks and the water just comes and sweeps them away. They had no chance. It didn't matter how good of a swimmer you are. There's the largest dam in the world is dropping water on your head. You can't swim out of that. Even 20 miles away, they're swept away. This is the image of God's judgment that it's held up now behind a dam, but God will open the dam and his judgment will pour out. And it will pour out and nobody will stand against it. It'll immediately overtake you. You won't even see it coming. It'll overtake you and sweep you away forever. That's the fate that awaits all those who die apart from Christ. But for those who place their faith in Christ, I hope you see this analogy, the, the dam of blood and of judgment that is broken open. In the analogy, Christ comes and takes that wrath in himself. He comes into the river. He stops the flow of blood. He stops the torrent of judgment. He stands to shield you. If you hide behind him, if you place your faith in him, he shields you from the wrath. He shields you from the river of blood. He shields you from the torrent of judgment. And he takes it all in himself. And he is a perfect defender, a perfect shield. For those that seek refuge behind him, they won't even get wet. They won't even be splashed with the judgment of God. If you're here this morning and you've never placed your faith in Christ, I hope the teaching of Revelation 14 opens your eyes to the truth of hell and fills your heart with the fear of it. I hope that you're not so callous and naive enough to think like so many people do that it will never happen to you. You won't wind up there. Listen, apart from Christ, you most certainly will wind up there and you will deserve it. But if you come to him for refuge, then you can sing one of our favorite songs. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins where sinners plunged beneath the flood lose all their guilty stains. The Son of God, the Son of Man takes the judgment in himself. He bears it in his body. When you come to him, you are purged from your sin and made white like him. Lord, we're thankful that you have made a way to escape the blood red stain of sin. You've led us to Christ. He is the one that bears the sickle, but he is the one that rescues as well. Lord, when the angels come, we pray they would come for us to rescue and not to reap. Lord, I pray for the hearts of anyone here this morning that has never put their faith in you. I pray that they would this morning. They would trust you. They would trust that you died for their sins. You were drowned in the flood. You drank the wrath of God down to the bottom. But you rose from the grave and offer eternal life for those that believe. We give you thanks for this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>
If you have any questions about what you heard today, or if you want to learn more about what it means to follow Christ, please visit our church website, ibcva.com. If you're not a member of a local church and you live in the Washington, D.C. area, we'd love to have you worship with us here at Emmanuel. We're located in Northern Virginia, and for more information about when and where we worship, check out our church website. I hope to personally meet you this Sunday after our service. But no matter where you live, it's our hope that everyone who uses this resource is involved in their own local church. Now may God bless you this week as you seek Jesus constantly, serve the Lord faithfully, and share the gospel boldly.